117. Yeah, that's me. Halo Combat Evolved was a strong start to the series, but it was flawed. Don't get me wrong, it is a classic for a reason. Things like the enemies and the combat influenced the games to come for being timeless and high quality. But the cracks of age show in many ways, from its repetitive level design to its poor vehicular combat. There needed to be a sequel that not only kept the positives, but fixed the issues with the original. And most importantly, truly defined what Halo is and is going to be. That's where Halo 2 comes in. This is where they settled upon how combat encounters and levels are designed from now on, and expanded upon almost everything the original did. More weapons, more enemies, better combat, and a true sequel. This is part 2 of my Halo series. A lot of the same mechanics remain from the previous game. Hops. Present. Great enemies. Here. Most of the smaller mechanics. Unchanged. Cortana. Sexy. It's the finer details that show how different these two games are. The first and biggest casualty of change is, obviously, the pistol. I'll miss you, buddy. There's still a pistol, but it's been nerfed to shit. It can't even zoom in. What's the point of it? But obviously the biggest mechanical change is the inclusion of regenerating health. Full regenerating health, not only the shield. This redesigns combat to only be short term preservation instead of the mix of short and long the original had. Any rough fight or close call is only a concern for as long as the encounter lasts. This does mean that they can put more demand on you in each fight and can design encounters with the knowledge that you will enter them with full health. The random difficulty spikes that can occur by entering with next to no health other than your shield aren't here. In my experience, Halo 2 is a bit harder as it appears that your overall health pool is lowered to ensure all enemies pose a threat. This can lead to moments of defense where you just have to back up constantly and pop shot enemies. That is luckily an exception rather than the rule. As with everything in life, this comes down mostly to personal taste as to whether or not you will like this change. I don't mind it, but I wish they could have kept and possibly evolved the health system from the first. I think that there are valid arguments for both sides of the regenerating health debate. I don't hate regenerating health, and overall I think Halo 2 did it well. Not all changes are as controversial. I think that we can all agree that dual wielding is pretty fucking badass. You can equip any two one-handed weapons like needlers, plasma rifles, pistols, SMGs, etc. Obviously, you can shoot two weapons at the same time, but can't throw grenades, and melee attacks will drop your second weapon, so there is a slight trade-off. But blasting through enemies with two SMGs in your hands just feels nice. It reminds me of my childhood. Moving on. Levels are designed differently from Combat Evolved. Most levels in Halo CE were on-foot combat encounters in tight corridors or wide open areas. There were some levels that involved vehicular combat and vehicles in general, but they weren't the focus. Take levels like Halo and the Silent Cartographer. They feature the Warhog heavily, but they use it as a means to get around the level quickly. In Halo 2 this has been changed as most levels now feature full-on vehicle encounters and they don't suck because the changes made to them. All the Covenant machines have boost, even the rates. Banshees have aerial maneuvers to dodge incoming attacks and feel better to use. Fighting against the vehicles is a ton of fun in vehicles and on foot. Dogfights with banshees feature a ton of movement over a wide area and fighting on foot is great with the addition of hijacking, which is a high risk, high reward as it can be challenging to get them into a position for you to safely do it. This can also be done to you so it's important to keep your distance. Due to these changes, levels can now flow between different types of encounters, some on foot, some in vehicles. And just to make one thing clear, during these vehicle sections you aren't forced to be in a vehicle, you just have the option to be. With some exceptions of course. Let's look at two levels that heavily feature the tank. Assault on the control room in the first game, and Metropolis from the second, to show the differences between them. But before that, let's look at the similarities. Both switch between different combat encounters of varying scale, some close quarter, some wide open battlefields. Both levels have clear end goals. In Assault on the Control Room, it should be obvious where you are going. And in Metropolis, a Scarab is seen at a few points throughout the level before you board it at the end. But Halo 2 is more enjoyably designed. I say that because, for one, the tank section is shorter, 
but more packed with action as ghosts will constantly come at you along with some raids and banshees. In Assault on the Control Room, a lot of the encounters are spread out with downtime between them where the only challenge is moving forward in a slow ass tank and you fight mostly ground units and turrets, things you don't need a tank to fight. The brief tank section in Metropolis is also matched by an equally short section in the Underground Highway for some ground combat before opening up again for an encounter that gives you the choice of sniping a few enemies or jumping in a ghost or warthog. Assault on the control room is still just chugging along in the tank before a short section in the snow that leads to essentially the same kind of encounters you've done earlier in the same level. And it finally ends with a climb up to the control room. Metropolis has a much better finale with the Scarab. During the fight, the game allows you the choice of when you want to jump onto the Scarab and take on a small army of Covenant that are all in the small thing like a goddamn clown car. The biggest complaint I'll give to the Scarab fight is that it's just another combat encounter. It's not something that's really special for the Scarab. You don't have to do anything except kill all the enemies. So that's a quick rundown of these two levels, and I think the variety of encounters and the more condensed action gives Halo 2 an edge. You aren't stuck in one type of encounter for long, it always changes and evolves. Combat in Halo OG can feel the same as there are quite a few levels that just feature a ton of corridor sections and repetition. In the sequel, each section is different from the last. Fighting on foot in the tunnels is different from the Scarab fight. In the tunnels you have more options for cover, while in the Scarab only one mistake can be the death of you. The vehicle section with the tank shows off its true power, while the second vehicle section asks you to be a bit more evasive as you'll either be in a ghost or a warthog, both not the most sturdy of machines. So I guess you can say, Halo 2 is where combat really evolved. <laughs> It set the standard for levels going forward with a greater focus on vehicular combat and varying the types of encounters. Which is a welcome change as this has the levels be more dynamic and vehicles are a new skill set for players to learn and be tested on. Level design isn't the only thing that has been expanded upon, the enemies and weapons have seen a similar increase. Halo 2 added new enemy types and new variations of old enemies. For new enemies there are the Brutes and the Yum Yi. Yum, yum, me, e. Who the fuck puts an e after a fucking? What the fuck is it? the flying bitches? Those. I already went over the properties of the elites, jackals, and grunts in the first video, so I won't repeat myself here. So let's focus on the newbies instead. Brutes are more aggressive and feral than the elites. They have a tendency to charge while angry, and they are always angry. Brutes are basically hyper intelligent gorillas that have access to powerful alien technology. And not just in like the Planet of the Apes variety, the Brutes are way more dangerous, they will fuck them up so badly. They don't have shields which makes weapons like the Plasma Pistol highly ineffective. I found that the Carbine and other precision weapons were very effective against them though. The Yan Mi A aren't the worst flying enemies and are essentially like flying jackals as they use the same weaponry and have a similarly low health pool, but they do come in significantly larger numbers. Elites and Jackals have new variations with jetpack and sniper versions respectively, and Brutes have a few variants that change their weapon of choice. Each enemy has a role to fill. Elites and Brutes act as commanders, Grunts, Jackals, and the FBs are the pawns, Hunters are the heavy duty guys, and how each enemy is used shows the role that they play. They're in standard formation, little bastards up front, big ones in back. There are usually more of the pawns like the Grunts with only a few Elites with them. Hunters are a rare occurrence and are only reserved for big moments. The knowledge of their properties aren't the only things worth knowing, their place in the army is similarly important. As the lowest rung, grunts are dependent upon the commanders and killing them will send them into a panic. Knowing the role each enemy has will help you in determining which one to focus on in any given moment. Also, random segue, but I love the personalities of the enemies in addition to everything else. What I've discussed for gameplay is good, but the personality of them gives the game heart. Everyone gives the grunts shit, but they are quite loyal and courageous. And probably taller than most of you motherfuckers out there. They are capable of operating ghosts, heavy machinery like fuel rod cannons and turrets, and will just go out there in the thick of it. No shield, nothing. Jackals are comparatively smarter. They won't go onto the front lines without a shield in hand, and can stay at range and snipe. They are risk averse. 
Elites are solid all-range warriors. They can use any weapon including the iconic energy swords. The ability to use jetpacks shows how well trained they are and how they can be used in any scenario. Brutes on the other hand are well named. Their weapons are heavy hidden and are the only Covenant forces you'll see regularly using UNSC shotguns. And something you'll notice in Halo 3 is how they aren't as elegant as the elites with their jetpacks. They remind me of the Flood with their aggression but with a more measured approach. Everyone brings something interesting for gameplay and for the world that they inhabit. That's why I love these enemies so much. And why I find the Covenant so fascinating. The Flood didn't get the same big boost in new enemies or variations that the Covenant did. There is one change that made these foes more terrifying. Remember those little popcorn dudes? Yeah, those. Those from the first one. Remember how they were a minor inconvenience at best? Now those same things actively search for dead, infected, and will reanimate them to have them join the fight. That change turns them from a minor inconvenience to something you actually have to kill or be forced to deal with more infected Flood. The only other major change is the Flood's ability to use and hijack vehicles. Other than that, they remain similar to the original and have a noticeable lessened presence. I need a weapon. Oh, you gonna get weapons? Halo 2 expanded upon the overall weapon selection from the first and some of the most recognizable weapons of the series found their start here. With the iconic energy sword, the sexiest sword ever conceived, with an instantly recognizable look and sound and the battle rifle, the best goddamn three round burst rifle in existence. Other new weapons include the Covenant Carbine, a mainstay and great for picking off weaker foes. The Beam Rifle, a badass sniper. Fura Cannons, Brute Shots, and SMGs. Most of the new Covenant weapons opt out of the battery design like the Carbine, Brute Shot, and Fuel Rod, but the Beam Rifle and Energy Sword still use the same energy based design. All weapons from the original return unchanged except for the pistol and the assault rifle. The assault rifle has been exchanged for the SMG which is higher damage but higher recoil. The change to the pistol is significant as it acted as one of the few precision weapons in the game and was one of the few capable of zooming in. And its ability to one shot hunters made encounters with them a joke. Without that cheap method of fighting them, they are rather capable foes and get more of a chance to shine and have fun engagements with. And now there are more weapons that fall under the precision category with the previously mentioned battle rifle and covenant carbine. So there isn't a need for a single weapon that can fill multiple gaps as before. The feel and purpose of each weapon is easily shown. The energy sword lunges at enemies and is only effective at close range, I found to be one of the best weapons to use against the flood as it will destroy their bodies, leaving them unable to return. The battle rifle is a good mid-range weapon as the burst does a lot of damage, while the carbine single shot works better at long range. The single handed weapons might not be the most powerful, but can be used with each other in any combination, dramatically increasing their damage output. I don't feel as though any weapon is unnecessary, they all have uses and situations for them. Even the three explosive weapons, rockets, brute shots, and fuel rods. Rockets are better for vehicles as they can lock on, brute shots are faster but the fuel rods are more powerful with the wider blast. As much as I'll shit on the magnum, it is good for taking out grunts and can be dual weld. So yeah, has a purpose. I would say this is an impressive feat as they expand upon what came before with the weapons and enemies but still keeping everything understandable and with a purpose. Halo 2 is special for another reason as it features multiple protagonists, Master Chief obviously and the Arbiter. The Arbiter is a disgraced Covenant commander who failed to protect the original Halo installation. This change expands the story that they can tell as we learn more about the Covenant and see a shift in leadership from their perspective. Obviously they want the Arbiter to be an eventual ally and make sure he is shown to be forgivable. He is noticeably hostile towards humans, but hasn't been shown murdering any. And every mission of his, he is fighting other members of the Covenant or the Flood. He starts to understand the human side the more he learns about the true purpose of the Halo Rings. Chief and Arby's control almost identically, but the Arbiter has an active camo giving him an advantage over Chief in my eyes, because this one little move is very OP. It can be used to sneak around enemies to ambush them or escape from fights. While in camo you can regenerate your shields, it ended up becoming something I relied on heavily. 
I was able to easily sneak past enemies and when in a difficult scenario I could run away and regenerate my health while being invisible. So a bit of an imbalance thing going on. I do like this aspect of Halo 2 and love seeing the game from another character's perspective and the story being told needed these multiple perspectives. It is like there are two stories that came together in the end. Even though I think in most ways Halo 2 is an improvement on the first one but it isn't perfect. One problem is the boss fights. There are three boss fights that all have different issues with them, but one main issue that all have is that they aren't worth being considered boss fights. First is the heretic. He uses holographic projections to attack you and is okay. He doesn't do anything else, he doesn't have much health and can be killed quite easily. It's basically a fight with three jetpack elites with a higher damage output. If you attack the holograms they disappear and that's all the fight has going for it. The Prophet of Regret is not really a boss. He is more of an enemy you have to punch a few times while avoiding others, which by the way, never stops being fucking funny to me. He doesn't do much worth focusing on, the arena you fight him in is actually pretty good in my opinion, but he isn't. The final boss is just a brute with a hammer that you have to wait for him to be made vulnerable and then attack. I don't hate any of these sections, they aren't bad moments honestly, but they don't deserve the title of boss fight. Another issue I have is how they gotten rid of the more open ended levels of the first as they are all completely linear now. That's not bad on its own but the levels I hate the most are the ones where you are stuck on a slow moving elevator or other transportation while the flood just floods in and attacks. It's boring and there's no way to speed it up other than possible speedrunning techniques. It reminds me of a road trip as a child. Are you there yet? No. Are you there yet? No. Are you there yet? No. When the fuck we gonna get there nigga? These sections aren't long but just slow the pace to a crawl. Most levels try to make sure you aren't dealing with one type of encounter and many levels allow you to avoid some fights whether it be through stealth or just run the fuck away. So having that agency ripped away is noticeable and not that fun. Jackal Snipers I don't even know what I can add to the conversation on these. They deal too much damage, have such high accuracy that anytime they appear they need to be priority 1. I guess that's it. If you want to know more, just look it up. They suck for a reason. People hate them for a reason. One complaint I'll lay on this game's regenerating health is that I don't know how close I am to dying after my shield runs out. It's hard to gauge and I'm surprised it took them until Halo fucking 5 to show the regenerating health bar. It's a problem I have with games that don't show a health gauge. It's hard to tell how close you are to dying without a clear visual indicator. None of these issues sour the overall experience. I love this game and there is no section I wish I could skip. I'll get even more into my personal taste here because god do I love this game. The remaster is absolutely beautiful and is one of my favorite games from an aesthetic standpoint. And I very much appreciate the collection allowing you to switch between the old and new graphics. It's nice to see how far we've come. Every character looks so much better. Well, maybe not everyone. And this game's visuals are my standard for remasters. I feel as though the Flood are less annoying here as with the increase in weaponry comes new ways to deal with them. Shotguns are back and better than ever, but the energy sword is even better. Still can be annoying though. Halo 2 is one of the most replayable games ever made and everything I discuss should be an indication as to why. Combat is dynamic with a varied set of foes and encounter types. Weapons are fun to use and all of them bring something to your arsenal. This game is just amazing. Well, that's Halo 2, a great sequel. I think that the combat and overall level design is a step up from what came before. Like I said in the last video, the original is still worth playing, but is dated. Halo 2 still feels and looks like a modern game. It really did set the standard for the series going forward. I know I don't speak about the multiplayer at all, which is even more important to some players than the campaign, but to me, the campaigns is where I had the most fun, even though it's not where I spend the most time. I fully respect anyone that disagrees with that, but that's just how I feel. I love this game, I love this series, and I look forward to Halo 3, which is coming up next. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed it, and have a great day. Goodbye. Sir, finish it.